Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, the talk of forest ecology. Uh, we're just going to dive right in. I do want to give an acknowledgement to uh, Michael Snyder for his assistance in some photographs that I have in this presentation. And uh, there's a lot of content in this one, so we're going to kind of zoom through, but uh, I look forward to questions at the end. Okay, so Gwen. Hold on, technical difficulty. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So we are talking about ecology, and ecology basically is the study of the relationships between organisms and their environment, and so we're going to talk a lot about the environment. And first, let's, I'd like to really couch this in where we are. So we are located in an ecoregion that's called the Northern Forest, which goes from uh, west of the Adirondacks in the Tug Hill Plateau all the way up to the tip of Cape Breton, and includes New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. So this forest um, is considered one bioregion, and that bioregion is defined by the species of plants and animals, as well as its climate. So we are very different than what you can just see even below us to ma in Massachusetts. So this forest is um, and also a, a globally significant forest. And this is, if you can't remember anything else from this whole talk, maybe you could just remember this global significance. It is the most intact, temperate, broad-leafed forest in the entire world. So this is a big deal. And we want to uh, protect this forest. So we're going to talk about what it is so that we know how to manage it in the future. So, whoops, went too far. There we go. Just another quick look at this, that uh, this, this northern uh, forest does have five different um, important uh, linkages that keeps it connected. One of the things that we're very concerned about is forest fragmentation. So if you take a look at the Tug Hill Plateau in the Adirondacks, if we aren't able to keep this area connected, the Tug Hill will turn into a bio-island and over time lose its significance in terms of functionality. And that's true across all of these linkages. So I just wanted to show that importance, that this is a uh, low-hanging fruit kind of thing. You know, if we can protect these landscapes, we can keep this forest intact uh, and whole and functioning. So now we're going to dive a little bit deeper right into Vermont here. So if we take a look at uh, our type the type of forest that we have here, you can see that we really show up with a, a beat, that, that beech, birch, maple forest. We, our matrix forest is definitely made of that northern hardwood. We also have other types of forests in Vermont too. We Certainly white pine, spruce fir is a major component. We also have an oak pine component that's along our uh, Lake Champlain and the Connecticut River Valley along with the oak hickory. So we, we definitely have a mix of different natural communities and different forest types, but our dominance is the northern hardwood. Um, we like to break this up into natural communities. That's based on the, the natural heritage classification system. So we have two basic distinctions, an upland forest and a wetland forest. And within those um, two large uh, distinguishing characteristics, we have a multiple, multiple different types of forest communities. Seven different kinds of spruce fir northern hardwood, six different kinds of northern hardwood, 12 different kinds of oak, pine, northern hardwood, and then we have specific wetland forests that are critically important to the functioning of our landscape, including floodplain forest, hardwood swamps, softwood swamps, and our wonderful seeps and, and awesome vernal pools. So we'll take a couple of looks at these things. So looking at a floodplain forest, you can see both of these photographs, one's showing it in a flooded condition. Floodplain forests typically flood at least once a year and sometimes twice a year. If you don't know where you are and what you're looking at, you could be you could be confused if you aren't right next to a river or a lake um, because it doesn't always it's not always flooded. But these floodplain forests are critical for controlling flooding, for soaking up nutrients. So when we talk about stopping phosphorus from getting into Lake Champlain, it's our, it's our floodplain forests that are doing just that. It's also a somewhat uncommon community because much of this has been 
uh, converted into agricultural land over the couple of hundred of years that we've been here managing our landscape. So there, it's uncommon, sometimes rare, and we find rare plants within these systems. It's also, the floodplain forests are also very important for connectivity and to allow animal movement. I'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. Hardwood swamps are really interesting places. Uh, they also are, are areas that the their water saturation is there all year round, deep organic layers of soil, very specific plants that grow there. Um, five of the six hardwood swamps that we have are either extremely rare, very rare, or uncommon. So we've, over the over the years, some of these have been drained and, and, and turned into agricultural land, pastures. Many of them, however, are coming back. And we, we do have uh, a fair number of rare plants in these areas. Red maple is a very common component of all the hardwood swamps. Uh, hardwood swamps are really interesting places to visit. We also have softwood swamps, and uh, one example of that that's in the photograph here is a uh, northern white cedar swamp. Uh, these are found on very rich soils, high in calcium, uh, carbonate, carbonate soils that are um, calcium-based. We also have black spruce and spruce tamarack swamps, which are found in more acid conditions. And then hemlock swamps are sort of in the middle. Uh, two of these swamps are very rare, and other two are uncommon. Again, wetland systems are not as common as our upland systems for many reasons. Some of that has been conversion. So we, again, have rare, rare animals, rare plants, and very unique conditions. Then we have seeps, which are tiny little coves that are um, depressions in the landscape where uh, groundwater from the surrounding area kind of bubbles back up again. Uh, we have often used these in, in farmscapes, in farm landscapes as where, where we put our springs in to uh, get water. But these are also really important places for our water quality. Uh, this is the source. The source of all of our rivers and streams and eventually into the lake is really coming out of these seeps where they've been, the water's been cleansed through, uh, through groundwater. Um, we also can find some rare plants in these locations as well. And then, of course, the vernal pool. I think vernal pools have uh, been getting much more attention in the last uh, couple of decades uh, because of all the really cool animals that live in these places. As you can see, um, the spotted salamander I've highlighted here with the, the yellow spots, um, that's a, a, an an animal that's about five inches and four to five inches long and is needs these vernal pools to survive uh, because of the predation of fish. And these vernal pools are also very difficult to see if you're not used to seeing what they look like because they vernal means spring and they dry up during the summertime after July. So if we need these pools to say to to stay flooded until about July so that some of these animals can make it to, through their life cycle. Uh, animals like the spotted salamander, once they've mated in a, a system, they will always go back to that same pool. Their, um, life, their life area, life zone is typically within 100, uh, 600 feet of the pool. Uh, we like to think of leaving it untouched for 100 feet around the pool so that we get lots of coarse woody material because these these uh, mole salamanders live under large coarse woody material. So we want big stuff in the woods, big trees that have fallen over next to these vernal pools to make sure that they're truly healthy vernal pools. Um, other species that are here are wood frogs, fairy shrimp, fingernail clams, exotic animals that you wouldn't expect to see in Vermont, but yes, you would. Okay, so let's get down into the dirty here. Uh, species requirements and what site is. A site offers and determines the, uh, the forest community. So what, what type of forest is there is based on what is underneath the forest. But in Vermont, of course, um, things have changed. Uh, it, our forest doesn't look anything like it did 300 years ago. We have cleared, by the 1850s, we had cleared 80% of our forest with only 20% in woods. The rest of it was open agricultural fields. So as the forest has returned, we actually have a very, very young forest. 
Uh, and many times you'll go into the woods and you'll see trees that have started all about the same time. This is an example of an even-aged forest. It's, it's a way to read the forest. So if you can determine whether a forest is even-aged or uneven-aged, you can know a little bit about its history. If this is a plantation, so the plantation is always a, uh, where trees have been planted together at the same time. Um, but there's also other examples. Uh, in this photograph, it's a reverted agricultural field. So this field was abandoned, and after it was abandoned, the trees came in. It's important to remember, however, that even in an even age situation, trees do not grow at the same rate. Different species grow at different rates. So a white pine tree can grow much, much faster than a sugar maple tree. So that really large white pine tree could would very, very often be the very same age as the a much smaller sugar maple tree. So they, you can find uh, stands that are have. Uh, varying degrees of dia varying diameters, but still be even aged. In an uneven age stand, however, the trees have been regenerating, um, seeding in and growing into seedlings over a very long period of time. So you get a wide diversity of age classes. You have young trees, middle aged trees, and much older trees. So you can see in this photograph, there's lots of layers. Generally, we, we would expect they would have to have at least three distinct age classes to be classified as uneven aged. Um, if there's only two age classes, we still consider in the forestry world uh, an even age stand. But we really want to make sure that the upper, the middle, and the lower canopy layers, that's the layer where the leaves are, are representing different age classes. So they're not all trees of the same age, of, but different sizes. They truly are trees of different ages. Um, but remember, trees within the same age class can grow better than others. So one tree is not like another tree. They're genetically different. So other um, components of the forest uh, include the structure, um, the, the vertical structure, which is from the forest floor up, including the herbaceous layer, the shrub layer, canopy layer. And you could consider this the understory, the midstory, and the overstory. So those would be three different layers that go vertically up from the ground. We also want to look at the horizontal structure, so areas that um, have openings or areas that are uh, have denser trees. The composition is different. The density is different. Uh, we would have trees that are hemlo a hemlock uh, pocket that looks very different from a hardwood. Uh, stand. We also want to include standing dead and dying trees. Those are critical, important features of our landscape for uh, diversity of structure. Also, dead, uh, dead trees that have fallen down on the ground. The bigger, the better. Uh, a tree that's hit the ground can last maybe maybe as long as it lived in some cases. So the function of a tree it far outlasts its actual biological lifespan. This is often called coarse woody material and as well as fine woody material. So if you can imagine a tree standing and then it falls over, uh, living, the wind came through, tree, the tree comes down, hits the ground, the bowl or the stem will be the coarse woody material and that the fine branches and crown would be considered the fine woody material. So you have different components of structure providing different functions in the landscape. This is a, another kind of quick example of taking a look at this in a photo, with a photograph. So if you look at the vertical structure where there's a gap, if you can see on the left side of the screen, this opening um, has light hitting the forest floor, which has resulted in this wonderful uh, growth of, of young regeneration. This is a dense stand of sugar maple that has responded to this gap that was created in the forest, either by a windstorm or through management. So if we harvest trees and create small gaps, we can create this um, situation where we can get uh, regeneration. Then we look at this multiple age system again, where we have all these different layers, there's different varying degrees of light, and then we have the, the coarse woody material in snags, where it has this high insect load, fabulous areas for nesting or foraging. Uh, all kinds of animals are using this. So we're going to get, now we're going to start talking really about the environment of the tree. And I, I love this slide. This, is, this comes from Michael Snyder. So, so Michael's the Commissioner of Forests and Parks, and that's Mike there in his 
when he was a little bit younger. Um, whoops, I need to go back. Um, just to say that you know this is a sequoia, and that sequoia seed is in the in his hand right here, tiny little seed. This is a seedling of a sequoia tree. Eventually, it looks like this, and so. This is an amazing thing that we can go from a tiny seed to a tree that is as enormous as one of these trees. But it can only be found in certain situations. They don't grow here in Vermont. They, we have other situations here. So the factors that affect tree growth uh, includes both the physical and the biological elements. The physical element is, includes climate and soil. The biological includes the associated plants, animals, fungi, and the microbes that um, change the environment within the microenvironment of the tree. So these biological aspects can, can vary dramatically and they'll be dependent on the climate and the soil. So these two things go together, they work together, it's the integration of the two. And this is what we call silvix. So silvix is the study of the life history of a given species of tree. And for a forester, the t silvix is, is the way that we understand how the tree will respond to management, to treatment in the forest. So it's, it helps us to predict what will happen so that we can manage a forest appropriately for the, for the long-term goals that we want. As I said, it's the study of the life history, but it, what it does, it gives us the requirements and the general characteristics of trees and the stands in relation to the environment. So it's not just a standalone, it's relation to what is existent where this tree is growing and why the tree is growing there. And those interactions and requirements include all of these things, soil, light, moisture, nutrients, flowering and seed production, topographic position, reaction to competition, growth rates, susceptibility to disease and insects. This is really what drives one tree to grow and, and where another tree won't do as well. That reaction to competition is an, is an enormous factor in silvix. So what do we mean by this? Some species have deep root systems and cannot tolerate shallow soils, while others have shallow roots and can tolerate a wide range of soils. The good example of this is bur oak with a very long tap root versus red maple. Red maple has a shallow root system and can grow just about anywhere. As I mentioned before, they are a dominant species in our in our wetlands, in our upland, hardwood upland wetland, uh, sorry, hardwood wetland forest. Um, and then some species require more sunlight than others. Uh, a good example of this is aspen versus sugar maple or white pine versus hemlock. So the aspen and the white pine uh, really require uh, direct sunlight where sugar maple and hemlock are tolerant of shade. And some species can tolerate saturated conditions while others can tolerate extremely dry soils. Uh, silver maple can really have wet feet uh, versus beech which really needs to be in a drier condition. Black ash, another species that does really well in really wet conditions as long as the nutrients are high versus red pine, which could not do as well in those situations. And different, um, in, we have different kinds of things happening too. Some species flower earlier than others. Red maple is an early flower. You can see that in the spring when the, our hillsides turn that beautiful reddish glow. That's our red maple flowering versus black cherry, which flowers a little bit later in the, in the season. Some species have great cold tolerance than others. Uh, balsam fir can handle cold much better than red spruce. One of the reasons we had red spruce decline over the years was that we, um, the acid rain was increasing the nitrogen in the soil, which uh, kept the red spruce growing longer in the year, allowing it to have um, winter, uh, winter injury. Some species have higher nutrient demands than others, and sugar maple versus beech is a perfect example of that. This is kind of a, a messy slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I just want to quickly, it's a, it's a, it's a good one for me to use. I, I like to use this, this slide, but I've circled a couple of things. So we can look at some trees live a long time and some trees don't. So looking at the potential lifespan, which is always just fun to know about, uh, sugar maple trees, they can grow pretty, they're, they're pretty old trees. 200 to 300 years old is a, is a sugar maple. Now compare that to our red maple which is only a 150-year biological lifespan. So they're, they live half as long, uh, and they're both maple trees. So they're very different, um, even in the same genus. 
Uh, so, and then we can look at uh, things like shade tolerance. So again, sugar maple is very tolerant of shade, can grow in the understory, where paper birch um, really can't. You won't find a paper birch in the understory of a forest unless it's got direct sunlight coming to it. So this chart is just kind of fun to, to use and have because um, you can compare things easily um, and looking at a lot of different kinds of characteristics. Shade tolerance is one of the most important uh, aspects of how we figure out what we want to do to a forest when we're trying to manage it or harvest it uh, using silviculture. So we know that our very, very intolerant species, which sometimes are called pioneer species, are things like aspens and gray birch and willows. You'll find those in fields that have just been abandoned where there's pure sunlight. Uh, and then we go up the, the gamut, the, the intol more, a little bit more intolerant, um, or le they're less tolerant than uh, the uh, aspens. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. They're a little bit more tolerant than the aspens, the paper birch, butternut, hickory, red pine, pitch pine, until we get up to those very, very tolerant species that we know in our forests, including beech and sugar maple. Hardack is a very tolerant species. Hemlock is the most tolerant species that we have. So we know that if we have a forest of beech, sugar maple, hemlock, that the only way we're going to get aspens and gray birch into that forest is if there is a large enough uh, disturbance to open up that forest for sunlight to hit the forest floor. So all of those things help us determine how we manage the forest. And you can find this out. There's two versions. There's the conifers and the hardwoods, and it's all online. Um, you can, it's an enormous amount of information in these Silvix manuals. Uh, for me, they're just real fun to, to read. <laughs> so looking at site, site's just tree habitat. It's the sum of all the physical factors influencing tree growth. Uh, soil, climate, um, those, are, those are site conditions. The physical site factors include bedrock, superficial deposits, soils, hydrology, and topography, the slope aspect and elevation. Now these are really easily observed compared to climate and natural processes. So we can actually see and feel and identify these, these uh, components of physical site factors. And then another quick chart that's very similar to what I was looking at before, but one thing I'll just point out quickly is we'll pick one tree. So we're gonna go look at sugar maple because sugar maple is our Vermont tree. And it needs a high uh, soil moisture, it needs a very high amount of nutrients and soil temperature and uh, low light. So this is what sugar maple needs. Sugar maple is a Goldilocks tree. And if we look at this in a different way and compare it to some other trees, you can see that red maple is a very diverse tree. It can grow in so many extreme different conditions, all the way from very, very wet sites to very dry sites. Beech is another species that can really handle a wide diversity of conditions. Yellow birch, less so, and look how narrow the range is for sugar maple. Sugar maple, our Goldilocks tree, it needs the very best conditions. So quickly looking at bedrock, um, we have a lot of different kinds of bedrock in Vermont. Um, granite, limestone, schist, shale, slate, goes on and on. Our neighbors to the east and to the west are actually have a, a larger component of granite, both in New York and New Hampshire. Vermont is blessed, we would say, maybe, with our limestone. We have a great deal of uh, calcium-rich soil uh, bedrock in our in our state, which makes it quite different from our neighboring states. Our, our mountains are actually much, much older um, and have shifted up so that we have the limestone component here. Um, they have dis distinct characteristics and, uh, and therefore really drive the kind of forest that you're going to find there. So here we have our bedrock geology of Vermont. If we have these calcareous red maple tamarack swamps, those are areas where the bedrock has, is very rich in calcium those limestone soils. We also have this limestone bluff cedar pine forest, which we will find right along the uh, edge of Lake Champlain and a few other places in the state, meant for Magog, uh, but really a lot along Lake Champlain. And of course, we've lost a lot of that due to development. Um, and then we have acidic outcrop. Now going to surficial deposits, um, these are soils. And this is also incredibly diverse and has been 
the result of the activity of glaciers here in Vermont. So glacial till covers much of Vermont, except for some of the exposed mountaintops. Um, and it, what glacial till is, it's this, it, it retains the characteristics of where it came from, so where the bedrock was derived. And as you can look, this is Chittenden County on the right, and um, you can see the uh, how th mixed up everything is. Well, that's mixed up because of the glacier and because of old riverbeds and the mouths of rivers that are coming down into Lake Champlain. So there's de deposits, sand deposits, gravel deposits, and glacial till all throughout. So it's really quite variable, and those soils came from a different location and were dropped by the glaciers. We can also look at uh, soils and know what kind of soils they are if we know our plants, which is my favorite part. I'm actually more of a plant person than I am a rock person. Uh, so if I can learn what plants will tell me what kind of soil I have, it really helps me manage the forest. So rich soils, we have a series of things that are uh, blue cosh, maidenhair fern. I'm going to show you some pictures of these in a minute. But I also know when a soil is acidic, if I can find the shining club moss and the blue beet lily and wet soils. I know where not to put a road if it's all sensitive fern and cinnamon fern. So I know what to do with the landscape by knowing the soils and knowing what the plants are. So here's a few, just a few looks at some uh, rich site indicator plants. So if you walk through the forest and you can smell onions, you're walking on wild leeks or wild ramps, and that will tell you immediately that that is a very rich site. Blue cohosh, uh, those blue berries are held throughout the winter. They're not something you want to eat, but, uh, and then maidenhair fern, the most beautiful fern, I think, in, in the state. Um, wild ginger, another site indicator. Those are just a few. So there's tons of things to learn. Learning your small plants can tell you so much about the forest. We also want to know about how the hydrology works, you know, where the water comes from, how the soils are saturate, saturated. Um, the abundance of, and the availability determines which communities grow where. So it actually determines what's upland and what's wetland. If you look at these photographs, we've got a beaver impoundment up on, the, on the very top, uh, and those are, there's a, Sedge meadow there, that's the result of a beaver uh, abandonment. And to the right, we have an alder swale with a spruce fir flats on both sides, and then, which is, again, uh, saturated floodplain soils. And then at the bottom, we have a very dry um, oak hardwood forest that has very little uh, moisture in it. So those forests are defined by the hydrology that is there. Vermont's climates, you know, we, we know we have uh, snowy winters, short summers. Um, these are the history of what we have for January temperatures. Uh, we have a lot of rain in Vermont, and the winds generally come from the west, and as we all know, the weather is changeable. Um, climate affects range. So if we look at those two species of maple, red maple you can see is all the way down to South Florida, and, and far up to Newfoundland. So, and then look at the sugar maple range, much, much smaller range. So you know it doesn't have the same adaptability, the same climate adaptability. We also know that climate is changing. And so the climate trends in Vermont, this is a quick slide to show that our summer temperatures are increasing uh, every decade, uh, a two degree Fahrenheit increase, but our winters are the ones that are increasing even more. So it's getting warmer in the winter, less snow cover, and we're getting even up to 4.5 degree Fahrenheit increase uh, per decade in Vermont. Um, since then, we've been measuring this since the 60s. But here's a quick look at how it falls down here, how the rain falls in Vermont. And you can see along the northern Green Mountains and to the southern Green Mountains, we have a lot of rain, so 48 to 52 inches. On uh, the very tops of some of these mountains, we're up to above 68 inches um, per year. The Champlain Valley and the Connecticut River Valley are the two areas that get the least amount of rain. And that drives the forest communities. Precipitation in Vermont, again, is uh, being affected by climate change. We have, if you can see that blue area in the northern, northeastern part of the United States, um, we have a 67% increase in episodes of uh, heavy precipitation events. This is a big deal. So we're getting a lot of rain all at once, um, and that's making things change as well. Um, 
so things are changing and we have to change ourselves to adapt and uh, allow our forest to be to remain healthy and as well as our infrastructure so uh, we do break things into biophysical regions i've been saying champlain valley and the northern green mountains but we also have several other biophysical regions in vermont and those also drive the natural communities that we have topography is a dramatic driver of species composition so actually in Vermont it's kind of we're we have an advantage we have really good soils we have limestone calcium rich soils and we also have a really varying degree of topography our slope aspect and elevation is diverse so that diversity allows for forests to self-adapt to climate change looking at these there's a north aspect we're going to get hemlock so in, but in a rich, that would be in an acid condition. In a rich condition, we'll probably get sugar maple. Uh, west and south slopes are drier, um, so we'll end up with red pine or oak. So that's going to drive where what species are there. Elevation also is um, is variable. So again, we have room for things to move, room for things to find uh, a, appropriate, adaptable places for the, for our species to continue. Um, Different environments um, have a different influence. Here we have a lowland uh, spruce fir flat and then a high rocky acid outcrop. Very different species here. <laughs> uh, slope makes a difference. Steepness, incline re related to the soil development and drainage. The higher up you are, the probably the less fertile it is. The further down you go into the, on, on a hillside, the, that's where all the, the nutrients are leaching. So you often will get rich site conditions at the lower slopes. Here's a nice example of slope aspect and elevation. And look at the species diversity that you see there. You know, you can really tell that there are different species and quite a number of different species, but you can quickly pick out the, the conifer versus the hardwood. Okay, so stand disturbance. You know, this also drives in Vermont our actually in the Northeast, this northern forest that I talked about right away in the very beginning of the talk, we are driven by small wind events. So wind events that happen around every 150 years in, a, in, a, in a, one specific place will probably knock down an area that's about a tenth of an acre up to two acres in size. So only small little disturbances are taking place. We, in our northern forest, are not exposed very often to things like tornadoes or hurricanes maybe once every thousand years, rather once every 150 years. So our forests are really driven by these small wind events. So if we know that, we should be able to manage our forests that mimic the way nature um, has created this forest. Other stand disturbances are ice, ice storms. Remember the 98 ice storm, if anybody was around, it affected a great deal of um, millions of acres of land, um, snapping stems and limb loss. Fire is a very minor component of the, of the northern forest. We often call ourselves the asbestos forest. High humidity and our species, uh, ma primarily maple, um, really limits the uh, fire from being a problem here. Flooding is, uh, flooding is important, actually, for certain riparian systems. We want seasonal flooding. Uh, and then pests, I could go talk a lot about pests. One of the things we've just had experience of this year is the forest tent caterpillar. It's a native insect. It actually affects the change in our forest. The forest is adapted to this insect. It affects us more uh, economically, but biologically, the forest knows how to handle it. And then, of course, we have human disturbance. We, as I mentioned before, we clear cut our forest. Um, by the term, by the middle of the Civil War, by the middle of the 1800s, uh, so that there was only 20% of Vermont was covered in forest. So that has changed our forest dramatically. We could never, at this point, return to a pre-Columbian forest. We don't. We lost um, a great deal of soil into Lake Champlain. So we we have shallower soils. We have a different climate. We also have acid deposition and other characteristics that are brought on that would be different and not not able to really return to what we had 300 years ago but we have a very resilient forest and has recovered succession that's how things change over time disturbance influences succession as i tried to describe a little bit ago those small wind events you get a little gap in the forest then it 
allows for regeneration to come in. So we are constantly changing. Our forest is con is a dynamic system. One of the things that we would that I would say if um, to think about climate change, to think about health of the forest, to think about what the uh, a healthy forest would be would be a forest that has a a diversity of species as well as a diversity of structure. If we can manage our forest with a great deal of different species, we're going to be allowing that our forest to self-adapt. One of the things that we do know is that we don't know what we need to know for our for to, to know what our forest will look like in the future. Allowing the forest to self-adapt is our probably our best option. So just a quick look at succession. It's a constant process. With or without us, it's happening. Plants take over an area, changes the soil conditions. So those aspen trees and those gray birch trees that come in, they're now sucking up all of the nutrients in the soil, holding it in their leaves, and then bring, letting it back into the soil as the leaves fall, changing the soil composition, that, which allows for other trees to come in, and the shade conditions that are, are um, brought about by the pioneer species also allows trees such as the yellow birch and the sugar maple and the beech to, to replace those earlier um, pioneer species. So things constantly change. It's not a succession doesn't happen in the sequence. It, it goes backwards, it goes forwards, it changes dramatically. And again, another quick picture of how this works. You know, you get regeneration, grows into saplings, then the pole timber, which are young trees that are competing with each other. Eventually, those young trees start to outcompete, and then trees are growing on their own. And the, they probably won't die until they reach an old age. And then you get to a very old forest. In an old forest, we don't consider a forest an old forest until a good number of the trees in that forest are more than 150 years old, but it also has to have openings and gaps and young trees and regeneration and standing dead trees and wood on the ground. So it has to have all the things to make it an old forest. So ecology informs management. Integrate the knowledge of ecology, the site conditions, the requirements, and only with this understanding can we really manage our forest well. So this is the end of uh, my talk. Uh, I just leave it with these two quotes, one from Gifford Pinchot, our first forester. Forestry is the art of handling the forest so that it will re render whatever service is required of it without being impoverished or destroyed. It's a very utilitarian uh, viewpoint. Then E.O. Wilson, today's greatest biologist, uh, the crucial factor in the life and death of a species is the amount of suitable habitat left to them. So I leave you with that and open it to questions. Okay, the first question I have